Um, so the a trigonometric polynomial in this talk will be defined like this. So it's a uh, trigonometric polynomial of degree n, so a polynomial in the uh, complex exponentials. And um, uh, the constraint is that this um, trigonometric polynomial should be non-negative for all uh, frequencies. So it's well known. So this is a convex cone in the coefficients of the polynomial. It's also one of the simplest uh, non-negative polynomials or uh, that can be characterized by a sum of squares theorem, a very classical sum of squares theorem. So this constraint can be formulated, this semi-infinite scalar inequality can be formulated as a uh, finite linear matrix inequality and uh, handled using SDP methods. And actually the dual of this cone is the cone of positive semi-definite uh, toplitz matrices, remission positive semi-definite toplitz matrices is the dual cone of the cone of non-negative uh, polynomials. So this uh, fact was the source of many uh, applications of semi-definite programming and signal processing in the uh, 1990s. Uh, so the equivalence between this constraint and the fact that it could be, could be handled by SDP methods. More recently, there has been uh, papers also where people, again, look at this uh, equivalence and formulate some uh, problems that are arise in uh, what's called continuous compressed sensing, where um, you solve over, uh, do sparse optimization, but over a continuous uh, domain. And some of these, uh, for example, in line spectrum estimation. And uh, these problems can be handled using uh, penalties that are similar to the L1 penalty for sparse optimization, but are, uh, need SDP to be um, represented. So this is the simplest um, uh, constraint of this type. It can be extended in many ways. You can have a matrix a polynomials where the coefficients are matrices and the constraint is that the matrix is positive semi-definite. Uh, you can have constraints where this uh, inequality only holds on intervals. Uh, it can be extended to um, rational functions or via sum of squares theorems. And of course, the major non-trivial extension is to uh, sum of squares theorems for uh, multivariate polynomials. Um, so the question is how, to, uh, how do these uh, formulations scale and how do uh, prox proxal methods help? So if we look at the simplest case again that we will consider in this talk and handle that using a uh, standard interior point inter implementation a general purpose interior point solver. Then this is actually the sum of squares uh, SDP uh, representation of the non-negative constraint. So the X matrix will be the matrix that gives you the sum of the uh, Gramian matrix and the sum of squares uh, uh, formulation. X is a positive semi-definite matrix. This vector X is the coefficient vector of the uh, polynomial. And then this linear operator D is uh, maps this symmetric matrix X to a vector of its diagonal sums. So the first element is a trace of x. The second element is the uh, sum of the elements on the first subdiagonal below, below the main diagonal, and the third diagonal, and so on. So if you give this uh, non-negative uh, constraint to a general purpose interior point solver, in this formulation you get uh, typically order nq n to the fourth per iteration complexity. And that's assuming that this is the main uh, most difficult constraint to handle and that the objective and the other constraints um, are uh, simple in comparison to this constraint. But you can also customize interior point met methods. There's a small customization you can do in forming the sure complement system or the barrier, um, the, the Hessian of the barrier function that allows you to reduce it to n cubed per iteration, which is not bad um, uh, as a function of n. So there's a class of SDPs that ac actually can be so, uh, solved quite efficiently by exploiting structure. So can we do better with proximal methods, uh, ADMM for example? So if um, we try to apply ADMM to, to problems that involve constraints like this, then the difficulty is that we can't project directly on this cone of non-negative polynomials or on the dual cone of uh, positive semi-definite uh, toplitz matrices. So you have to split the constraints in, um, by introducing splitting variables. You could project very efficiently on this subspace, but you still need to project on the cone of positive semi-definite matrices. So that takes an eigenvalue decomposition, so that's also n cubed. So it doesn't 
immediately improve compared to the in-cube methods that we already have. But there's another uh, possibility that uh, I always find very interesting in the proximal um, uh, literature. Uh, if we had an, um, projection, a non-Euclidean uh, Bregman projection on these constraints, then maybe there's a possibility to scale it better than in cube. And so that's the purpose of the talk, to um, um, examine whether we can actually project on this cone of non-negative polynomials immediately by um, in less than n cubed operations per iteration by using a non uh, a Bregman uh, distance instead of the Euclidean squared distance. So I'll start with some uh, notation and uh, background on Bregman distances and the generalized proximal methods. Then we look at uh, uh, the Bregman distance we'll use and then I'll have some numerical results. So Bregman uh, generalized distance is defined by, uh, in terms of a strictly convex kernel function phi. So it's a strictly convex function, uh, differentiable on the interior of its domain. And then this is the generalized uh, uh, Bregman distance defined by that kernel. So it's convex in x for fixed v. It's non-negative uh, because phi is convex. Uh, non-negative for all x and v. It's in general not symmetric, so it's not the, uh, a distance. And then since we um, will uh, typically, in interesting cases, phi will have a restricted domain because it's used to implicitly uh, represent some uh, complicated constraint, we'll have to be careful in how we define this on the boundary of the domain. So for the second argument in the distance function, v has to be in the interior of the domain of the kernel function because we assume it's, uh, we need a gradient in the definition. X can be uh, any element in the domain of the kernel function, so that may include some points on the boundary of the domain. We don't have to assume that the domain is open or closed, but if it contains, uh, so X can be any point in the domain of the kernel function. And then using this uh, generalized distance, you can define a generalized proximal operator. So uh, the notation here will be uh, to use two arguments in the proximal operator A and V. So it maps um, A and V to the minimizer of this optimization problem. So this would be the generalized proximal operator of a function G, where the uh, superscript denotes the Bregman distance we use. Okay. So in the standard case for a uh, squared Euclidean distance, it uh, reduces to this definition. And then you see, because uh, the result only depends on the difference between A and V, you need only one argument in the proximal uh, operator. In the general case, you don't have that property, so that's why we have two arguments in the proximal operator. And then, uh, actually, in our application, we look at the uh, generalized projection. So G is an indicator function, and then it reduces to uh, this uh, definition. So this would be the generalized Bregman projection on a set C. And again, you have two uh, arguments, A and V. So um, different methods require different assumptions on the uh, Bregman uh, distance. So for the methods that we'll discuss, we'll need that to assume that um, the minimizer of this problem exists and is unique for every vector A and also every V in the interior of the domain of the kernel because it appears in this as second argument in the distance function. Uh, We'll also have to assume that the minimizer, the solution of this minimization problem, is in the interior of the domain, because typically the minimizer will be used in the next iteration as the second argument in this proximal operator. So it has to be in the interior of the domain. And of course, we have to assume that these proximal operators are inexpensive to compute to make it uh, interesting. And an example of a proximal method, uh, well, first, uh, so the classical example of uh, these uh, definitions is the relative entropy. So if you take the negative entropy function as a kernel function on the non-negative ordent, you can define it for uh, x0 by taking just assigning 0 to x log x. Then this would be the uh, Bregman distance, the relative entropy. And then the generalized projection on the uh, just this hyperplane is given by a very simple closed form uh, formula. And you see it's defined for every uh, positive vector v, for every vector a, and the result is always strictly positive because uh, of this property of the entropy function. 
So an example of a method, and the method I will use later, is this um, improved proximal gradient method by Auslander and Tabu. So it's an extension of uh, one of the accelerated Nestrov methods to um, uh, Bregman distances. Uh, so it applies to, it's a projected or a proximal gradient method where you minimize a smooth um, function f over a convex set c. So this is the typical iteration and the uh, standard proximal step, proximal gradient step in Nestrov method is uh, replaced by this generalized uh, Bregman proximal uh, distance. And here, here you see why you need a property that the result of this pro uh, um, projection is always in the interior of the kernel because VK will be used in the next iteration as the second argument in the projection. And that's satisfied, for example, by this uh, relative entropy kernel uh, distance function, and that's a property we'll also uh, need. Um, and so this algorithm has a one over k squared type of convergence, the same as uh, Nestrov's uh, methods. So then we look, uh, go back to the non-negative polynomial uh, problem. So we'd like to solve problems, for example, like this, where we minimize a convex function f over the cone of non-negative trigonometric polynomials. This was the definition. So f of x is the um, polynomial. For simplicity, we'll assume that x, the coefficients, are real. So then it's just actually a cosine polynomial. And then this was the SDP representation where D is this mapping that maps the symmetric matrix X to the uh, diagonal sums. And we'll add a normalization um, to the constraints. So the adding the or normalizing the first coefficient to be one is the same as actually normalizing the total power in the power spectrum to be one. And then the distance we'll consider is um, the Bregman distance defined by this kernel function and that's known as the Itakura Saito distance. And the motivation for using this kernel function is uh, easier explained by showing some contour lines. So an alternative choice, uh, and maybe more obvious, um, or certainly better known uh, distance function, and maybe more uh, natural also, in, uh, if you look at the analogy with the discrete case and the relative entropy, would be, use a, would be to use the, to use the kullback leibler distance, which is the Bregman distance for this kernel function. This is the one we'll use, and that gives us this itakura Saito distance. So here we show the contour lines of the kernel function on the, uh, for the three-dimensional cone. And this is a section of the three-dimensional cone uh, normalized to have the first component equal to one. So it's a three-dimensional cone, and if you intersect it, at x0 is 1, you get these uh, contour lines. So on the boundary of the cone, this function is finite. And it has this uh, essentially smooth property. So the derivative increases to infinity as you increase, uh, approach the boundary of the uh, set. The same as uh, we have in the non-negative orton and the relative entropy. The other kernel function doesn't have this property. It um, is also finite on the boundary, but the gradient doesn't necessarily go to infinity as you approach the boundary. And this is an important uh, property in the methods that we'll discuss. So in both cases, actually, the projection on the cone will be easy. So there exist very efficient capstrel uh, methods for projecting on this uh, using this distance, but it doesn't have the property that the projection will automatically be in the interior of the uh, feasible set. Um, so this kernel function, this uh, kernel entropy kernel, has actually some very nice properties and uh, it, um, also interesting to look at it from a convex analysis um, viewpoint. For example, you can show that this function, the value of this function on a point in the non-negative cone, is the optimal value of this uh, SDP or a nonlinear SDP where we have a matrix variable X, positive semi-definite, and then we maximize the, we really maximize the one, one element in the matrix X, or minimize minus the log of that one, one element. So the optimal value of this uh, optimization problem will be uh, this uh, negative entropy. At the optimum, X will be rank one, so it can be factorized as BB transpose. And B is actually the minimum phase spectral factor. So it's the solution 
exit the, the factorization uh, of this property of this matrix with the property that this uh, polynomial is stable in the uh, in a unit circle. And actually, uh, of course, we don't have to solve the uh, so compute the spectral factor to solve this. Uh, you know, by solving this SDP, there exist very efficient methods for uh, computing spectral factorizations. And actually, one of the um, uh, classical methods is to solve this quadratic set of linear equa nonlinear equations by just Newton's method. And it can be shown that if you start with a stable initial point B, that this converges, Newton's method converges very quickly to the um, um, minimum phase spectral factor for that optimizes this problem. So this uh, entropy kernel function can be computed very efficiently using spectral factorization. Uh, the dual of this problem is also interesting. If you look at the dual, we get um, this problem. So E here is the first unit vector. So we have a vector variable Y. T of Y is the toplets matrix constructed with uh, Y as first, um, in its first column. So this is the dual of the problem I just showed. So this optimal value is also equal to this uh, negative entropy kernel. If you optimize over W and Y. So that gives you the gradient of the kernel. So the optimal Y will give is the negative of the gradient. And uh, you can compute this optimal Y efficiently by solving uh, this equation for Y. So given the spectra uh, factor B that solves the primal uh, problem, you can uh, solve efficiently uh, this equation over Y to find the Y solution for the dual problem, and it gives you the gradient of this entropy kernel. Um, and the algorithm is uh, Levinson's algorithm, but uh, run backwards. Uh, so you can also uh, interpret this dual problem or related to the conjugate function of this entropy kernel. So if you eliminate the scalar value variable W from this dual problem, you get uh, a maximization problem like this. And psi here is this uh, convex function. So it's defined for um, positive definite toplets matrices uh, T. So this is the one, this uh, inside the log is the one, one element of the inverse of a positive definite uh, matrix, toplets matrix T of Y. So the log of that uh, one, one element is a convex function, smooth convex function of Y. And it's actually up to some sign and uh, constants. It's the conjugate of the, um, this uh, entropy kernel function. So from convex analysis, um, we know this is uh, an essentially smooth function, so it's of the Legendre type. So the conjugate will also be, have this property. And in this case, the conjugate is actually uh, this function, which is defined on the interior of the dual clone, and then uh, increases to infinity as you approach the boundary. So then uh, we get to the Itakura Saito distance. So this is the distance, Bregman distance function that's defined by this uh, negative entropy kernel. So that's the expression as an integral. It comes from speech processing. It's actually popular in speech processing as a spectral distance measure to compare power spectra. And we're interested in using this um, generalized distance as a Bregman distance in a projection on this uh, normalized um, non-negative uh, trigonometric polynomial cone. We don't have to add the cone constraints explicitly because that's taken care of automatically by the domain of this function. And that's, of course, the whole point of using this generalized distance function. So this is a, a problem in X with um, one constraint. So you can handle the Lagrange multiplier. <coughs> or equivalently solve the dual problem in the Lagrange multiplier. So you get an unconstrained um, maximization problem in the dual with one variable. And that um, you can solve very efficiently. So to compute this projection, we have to solve an unconstrained uh, convex or concave maximization problem. This would be the H, if H is a cost function in the dual problem, then the derivative uh, looks like this. So there's a unique solution. It's defined for values of lambda 
um, greater than the minimum eigenvalue of this um, toplets matrix. And the C argument here in the toplets matrix is the A vector because the gradient or the minus the gradient of the gradient, uh, minus the gradient at, uh, of the kernel function at phi. Um, so you can solve this efficiently using Newton's method. It's some kind of secular equation in uh, like a trust region problem. If you use Newton's method, then you need to um, find the derivatives, first and second derivatives. And you can do that efficiently by factorizing uh, this positive definite toplets matrix you need in the definition. So that the classical algorithm for doing that is the Levinson algorithm, which has an order in squared complexity. And there also exist uh, super fast solvers that actually have n uh, log squared n complexity, fa factorizing a positive definite symmetric toplets matrix or solving uh, coefficient uh, systems with that uh, matrix. So you can use that to find lambda very efficiently at a cost of uh, roughly order n squared or even less per iteration if you accept that Newton's method will take a very small number of iterations. And then from the optimal lambda, you find the optimal projection on the using this distance. Um, so this is a small example uh, where we use this in uh, Auslander and Taboo's uh, uh, proje projected uh, gradient method. So here we're actually fitting a toplets matrix uh, or a covariance matrix that has a structure of a positive semi-definite toplets matrix plus a multiple of an identity matrix to some sample uh, covariance matrix. So that's the meaning of this problem. The variables are y in the toplets matrix and the scalar s that multiplies the identity. And the trace is added to um, make the solution t a low rank. And the purpose is to, in signal processing, is to estimate parameters in a signal model like this, where you have a small number of uh, complex exponentials plus white noise, and you want to find the, identify the number of harmonics and their frequencies. Uh, so the uh, blue lines then show you the estimated spectrum from the solution of this problem and then computed from the optimal y compared with the true spectrum. And the dual of this problem is actually a problem in the form that we've been studying of optimizing and uh, where you optimize over the uh, non-negative trigonometric polynomial cone. And the uh, solid line here is this optimal um, dual solution, the optimal trigonometric polynomial. So that's a problem we solved with this um, IGA method from uh, Auslander and Taboo. And this is how it converges um, on a log-log scale. So you see it roughly follows the 1 over k squared um, convergence. And then for larger problems, to compare the uh, complexity per iteration, we uh, looked at a simple problem where we project, compute the Euclidean projection on this normalized uh, cone. Uh, and look at the complexity versus n. So for interior point methods, um, Sidumi or SDPT3, we get something that's uh, exactly n to the fourth as expected. If you use this um, proximal uh, gradient method with this fast projection, you get something that's very close to n squared. This is a total time and this was a time per iteration. Um, So you get this reduction from n to the fourth to roughly n squared. Um, so some extensions, uh, maybe I'll skip the first one. Um, in this, when using this, uh, the methods we used was this Auslander and Taboo proximal gradient method that minimizes f of x subject to the cone constraint, where f is a smooth convex function. And that, of course, is uh, only a limited class of problems that has that form. In general, uh, to make it uh, more general, you could uh, very uh, handle more general problems like this, for example, where you minimize f of a of x, where a is some matrix. Then um, I think an, um, this generalized projection can be used in the chambaud poc method that was mentioned uh, this morning. And there is a paper in 2016 where they extended to non-Euclidean Bregman distances and uh, so that could handle problems like this, where if f, for example, has a uh, simple um, proximal operator, standard proximal operator, then you would need this generalized projection 
that we discussed, and then the standard proximal operator of F solves problems uh, like this. Okay, so to summarize, we looked at some um, possibility of speeding up um, optimization problems over non-negative trigonometric polynomials by using a Bregman projection instead of the general um, Euclidean projection or uh, proximal operators. Um, we use this Itakura Saito distance, defined like this. And the motivation was that in this distance, the projection on the normalized cone um, can be solved using uh, or reduces to a simple nonlinear equation in one variable that you can solve using Newton's method. And the cost per iteration is roughly order n squared or maybe even less with these super fast methods. And um, so I hope this also extends to other or can be used in other proximal methods and also be used for uh, more general um, polynomial optimization problems. Thank you.